The last time that I had you here with me inside the polycrub, we had just built the first bed, which is over here to my left. And the plants in that bed are thriving and growing by leaps and bounds. All of the tomatoes in the back are growing up and around the string. And every day I come out here and see if any of them need any training or they need any of their side shoots nipping out. And then the peppers and the chilies, basil, they are loving growing inside here. It's nice and warm, it's protected, and the beds are retaining moisture really well. Now that has to do with not only the way that we built them, so including that silicon step, and if you didn't catch that last time, definitely go and check that out. Ingenious idea for not only extending the life of raised beds, but keeping the moisture in. But I've also mulched the surface with compost, which is what I'm doing over here with the second bed. Now again, I have planted tomatoes at the back and these are all different varieties for the most part and many of them are different from the ones over on the other side. I put a lone chili down at the very end and then I have decided to plant butternut squash. There's two plants here and it doesn't really do well outdoors here, not unless it's covered in some way. And we love butternut squash, who doesn't? So I thought, let's try it out. No doubt they will grow and go absolutely everywhere, but hopefully we'll get some squash from them. Now, to keep them happy and keep the moisture in these beds, I'm putting compost on the surface, so it's mulching with compost. And you can do the same, whether it's out in the garden or in your raised beds in a polytunnel. And what this does is it stops weed seeds from germinating because it creates kind of a cap on the surface of the soil and it also locks moisture in. So when you have a, a layer of mulch on a bed, if you dig down into the soil a little bit, you'll see that it's much moister for longer compared to soil that's exposed. And so this is one of my tactics that I'm using to keep these beds moist, at least until I figure out a decent irrigation system and I'm working on it and there are a couple of ideas that I have going on right now and I will address that and show you what I'm planning on doing in a future video. But until then I'm still watering in here and the mulch will help keep these beds really moist. Now watering in the summer really takes over, especially if you have a, a pretty big garden or you live in a warm climate or you're growing under cover where there's no rain and it's quite warm itself. And the more watering you do, the less time you have for other jobs. And so it's important to find a system. And I have a lot of jobs for today and I wanna see how far we can get through them, but I'm gonna show you the garden. We're gonna have a look inside the greenhouse because I'm going to be planting up in there and just really excited to show you the garden in May. I do anything else I have to finish mulching this bed but let's talk about mulching because that might be something that you might not be aware of or might be a bit confused about because the word mulch has a couple of meanings it can be the material so it can be compost it can be wood chips it can be even plain newspaper that you put on the soil but it's also the act of covering the soil so you you mulch with a mulch material and my mulch of choice is compost because it gets used up by the soil organisms it has nutrients for the plants and it does such a good job at locking moisture in and keeping weed seeds from germinating now all i'm doing is covering up every little inch of soil with a good layer of about half an inch to an inch even in places. It doesn't have to be exact, but I'm making sure to cover up every square inch of the soil underneath. Most plants do not like mulch being drawn up around their stems or their trunks. There are exceptions like the tomatoes. They will grow roots from anywhere along their stem, so it's not a big deal. But when I'm mulching around peppers or the squash back there, then I'm going to be a little bit more considerate and just mulch 
to within about half an inch of the plant. And that will be safe, keep it happy, but also protect the roots that are growing around it. This bed, mulched, ready to grow, looking really good. But if you compare it to the plants growing in the first bed, those plants look a lot smaller. And it's interesting because I sowed all the seeds at the same time. The only difference is that the plants on the right have been growing in their planter box for a couple of weeks. And I've just planted these ones. So they've been growing in pots in the greenhouse. And so you can see just how happy these plants are going to be. And don't worry, the ones on the left will catch up pretty soon. Now over here, you can really start to see how the tomatoes are growing up the strings. So each tomato plant has a string. This is made out of wool. So it's a really good, strong, natural string that isn't going to break, fingers crossed. And I'm coming in here pretty much every morning, having a look, winding the plants around the string. So as they grow their main stem, I just wind it around the, the uh, string and they grow up really happily. And eventually they will reach the very top. The polycrub beds are coming together and that makes two out of three completes. And we're beginning to build the middle one tomorrow. And so in the space here in the center, there'll be another bed and we'll be building it in the exact same way as the other two. It'll be slightly shorter. So I want a little bit of space here at the, at the very back to access the door. But you can see that little mark of white flower there on the ground. That's where it will start and it will go all the way down and be flush with the other two beds. Let's go have a look in the greenhouse and I'll show you what I'll be planting in the middle. It may look like it's snowed on the greenhouse roof, but that's not snow. It is a greenhouse shading paint, a kind of a whitewash that you can apply to the glass of greenhouses. And what it does is it diffuses the light inside so that it isn't so strong that it's going to scorch plants. And I was finding that a lot of my plants were looking a little bit scorched in there recently. So I applied that so that I can continue growing in here for the summer. It's starting to look a little bit empty because I'm preparing for some planting in there and also because I'm hardening off lots of different plants, all different types of herbs and globe artichokes, dahlias over there. I've got even more over here, beans, achocha. I've got Cape gooseberry and then also some ornamentals, different types of cone flowers. So echinaceas and bee balm, lots and lots of stuff. But inside the greenhouse, I have the plants that are going out into the polycrub in the middle bed, and they're just back here. These are eggplants, aubergines, and there are two different varieties. There's one that I got from Baker's Creek a couple of years ago seeds, they're called Mitoyo. So there's one of those, it's a really good one. And then a really standard type called Moneymaker. So this is a really common type here in Britain. And so there are six of these total. Now, it's not just going to be eggplant in that center bed. I'm also going to be planting melons. And this is a heritage variety and it's called Petit Gris de Rennes. And I've grown it before back at the old house. And I think that these will do even better inside the polycrub. tidied up the greenhouse now and although I initially wanted to take at least one of the pallet planters out I had a change of heart and so I've put them over here and stacked them actually together so that they can create kind of a, a larger area for growing greens under cover. Now over here in this corner this is what I was setting up. It's a gifted item from a company called Auto Pots 
and I know of at least one other, actually two other gardeners that are well known that use these. And I've been very curious about them because they self water the plants that are growing in the pots. And so I have four tomato plants over here. I've already planted up this one. This one I think is a Fuji pink. That's right, Fuji pink tomato. And then I have an Ailsa Craig that I'm going to put in here. It's just a really typical red salad type tomato. And then my friend Georgie dropped these off last night. This is an interesting variety. It's a determinate tomato called Creamy Sausage American. And they'll only grow between three to five feet tall and it's more of a bush type. And they look a little bit worse for wear, but apparently also the leaves are quite delicate. So I'm going to give these a go in the auto pot. They're gonna go here because there's a little bit less space, vertical space in the corner and over here just so that if they do actually stay small, then it'll be a little bit more manageable over here by the pallet planters. So I'm gonna get these planted up and this is the system over here for watering. I just fill it with water and it's, there's no electricity needed, it's just gravity fed, but I won't turn that on. The, the plants need to be established for about a week beforehand. So I'm going to plant these up, water them and leave them. And then in a week, I'll turn that on and see how it does. And I'll let you know how it goes as well. It's always fun to experiment with new products, especially if they can save you time watering. Maggie has been taking to chilling out in here and sleeping in that far side of that pallet planter and she's been sniffing around in here since I've moved these around and I don't think that this new compost that I've filled it with is very cushy or doesn't smell quite right. She's not settled into them which is great because I'd like to sew them up with some new seeds now and I've got a couple of packets here. I've got spinach, matador, which is a bolt resistant variety. I'm going to put it in that pallet planter. And then I have mixed leaves spectrum, which I'm going to put into this pallet planter. Now I've filled them with some of that manure green waste compost that we're using in the polycrub, but it's, it's quite dense and there's lots of chunks in it. Hey, hey, you're not helping. You are not helping. <laughs> So I've uh, pushed it all down. I've given it a good watering in and I'm going to lightly sprinkle it with seeds and then put a much lighter mix on top. And so that means that there'll be richness underneath, but that the seeds won't struggle to get up through big chunks. And it also means that there's going to be some lovely greens here in the greenhouse for us and because they're bolt resistant especially the spinach I don't have to worry about the heat as much there are a few things that I want to show you in the veg patch first of all the roses are doing great they're even starting to bloom. Remember, these are the David Austin roses, generous gardener that I brought from the old house and they've been living in a container for over a year before I planted them out and they didn't mind at all. Just below the polycrub is an odd little slope and it needs to be cleared of anything before we plant anything there. And so I've laid black plastic down over this area and I'll be putting a little bit more on the end in a bit. It's so all weighed down with those white quartz stones. And before long, this will be completely clear of the grass and the nettles and the other weeds that are growing underneath right now. And I have an entire video showing how to use this method of using black plastic to easily clear land. So if you have an area that you'd like to clear pretty easily, effortlessly, head over and watch that video next. Before we get to the veg patch, I just want to show you the plum tree. Now this was here when we moved in and last year I told you about it being affected by, I believe it's a fungal disease called plum pocket and it distorts the fruits. And I'd hoped that I'd picked off most of the affected fruit and had stopped it from 
coming back this year, but obviously not. You can see here that the fruit is still affected. And as far as I'm aware, there are no treatments for this that I can buy and use. And to be perfectly honest, to save this tree and make it productive again, I would even consider products that are not organic because it doesn't seem like there's anything that I can do about it. And I would hate to have to take this tree out. It is a lovely tree. But regardless, I will be giving it a really solid pruning next month. You don't prune plums in the winter. If you do, they can get another fungal disease called silver leaf that kills them. But if you wait until midsummer for plums, you can take bits of branches off, anything that looks like it's got canker, and shape the tree. And I had a good eye of this tree over the winter and there are quite a few pieces I want to take out first this year and then of course get on a ladder and remove all of the fruits that are affected by that plum pocket yet again. So keep your fingers crossed for this tree. Bit by bit the veg patch is taking shape and I would say that May is one of these months that seems a bit odd. It seems like there should be a lot more growing and green in the garden but it does look a little bit brown still. No matter, by this time next month, most of these beds will be full because I have beans, I've got cucumbers, I have a chocha, I've got so many plants on the patio right now, hardening off, that I'll be planting out here. This bed here in front of us though, it has cabbage in the foreground and peas on the pea frame. And I have to admit that I've taken out the, the original peas that I put in there, the meteors, and I replaced them with sugar and because they just didn't fare very well. That might have something to do with Maggie jumping all over them. It could also be the slugs. So I took those out and I fortunately had some sugar and peas on the go as well. So I just put them in there and they are growing amazingly. My very first broad beans ever. In all of my years of growing a vegetable garden, I've never grown broad beans because I haven't liked them. And then last year, I just tried some on the off chance that maybe I'd changed my mind. And guess what? I like broad beans. And I think they're called fava beans in the States. Now, I started these in autumn of last year and they actually got quite leggy. And so I pruned them down. I just took the tops off and it seems to have really benefited them. They've grown really strong. I've had no problems with aphids or black fly. That's a common affliction of the tips in particular. None at all. And there are loads and loads of pods. You can see them down here at the base, over in this area where Maggie took out a couple of the plants. You can really see them sticking out. So this is a success. Not only do I really like broad beans and so does Josh, but they grow really well here and I learned a few things as well. Now the supports I put in not too long ago, maybe about a month ago, I think I would put them in a little bit earlier next time because they do need that extra support from the wind. But other than that, really, really solid crop. All of the bare root trees that I've planted and the shrubs are doing great. So these are all minaret trees. They grow as cordons, so they grow tall and slender, which is why they have either an archway or a vertical stake for them to grow against. They really need that for support. Eventually, I hope to take these metal frames out once these two on this side and the other two on the other become a nice archway, so a natural living archway. So that's the plan with this and it, they're on their way. And there were plenty of blossoms on these not too long ago. Good healthy leaves, healthy foliage. The trees in the garden are doing well, as is the hedge. Again, lots of leaves and they'll grow bushier and leafier as the years go on, despite Maggie attacking many of them. So you can see here, look at that. Oh, so much work went into planting these. It's just so good to see that they're doing well. What's that? What is this? What's this in the grass? 
just below the apple tree is where I'm putting the dahlia bed and I've put I think four dahlias in already as tubers and they're starting to come up but the slugs are having a field day with them so I need to get on top of that and then just to its left this is the new perennial bed and I have the Taunton Dean kale down here at the end with stakes for when they grow a little bit taller. I've also squeezed in a couple of oka on either side of a rhubarb that I've placed there. There's also the Egyptian walking onions, the uh, perennial leeks, which will lose their greens very soon and then they'll come back up again towards the end of the summer. And then sea kale, Welsh onions, and skirret down there. Now I've noticed that there are quite a few slugs in this bed as well. So slugs, I think, are public enemy number one from my garden for this year. I need to really get them under control. It suddenly occurred to me when I was just talking about slugs that they must be hiding out somewhere. And this bed, hey Maggie, this bed of cabbages I've had netted against uh, the butterflies so the cabbage white butterflies and so there was actually quite a lot of grass growing around the edges and it was really dense underneath I've got them really closely planted together because initially they were uh, spring greens and now I'm letting them heart up a bit and there are places where I have taken cabbages out but underneath all of the leaves were quite a bit nibbled by slugs. I mean, you can see a little bit of damage there, damage there, and I've found so many under here. There's one right there. There's so many slugs here. So it's obvious that the slugs are hanging out here underneath the cabbages and then going out and decimating everything else in the other beds. So I've been taking all of the underside leaves off and clearing it of any weeds just so it's a bit more open under here and I'm gonna go and get some beer traps and lay them down and see how many slugs I catch by the morning come on slugs come out and party <laughs> this is the last tin of cheap beer from my birthday party last year and I'm setting it out here in hopes that all of the slugs in this bed come out tonight lured by the scent of that yeasty sugary solution climb inside and then are no more and I can come out tomorrow and empty these and then perhaps get some more beer or make a yeasty solution you don't have to use beer for beer traps you can mix together some yeast and, and sugar and water it does the same thing and I might actually do that slugs are the number one garden pest that more gardeners worry about and lose sleep over <laughs> than any other and they affect pretty much everyone in a temperate climate now there are so many ways to control their numbers and the easiest is of course slug pellets but slug pellets have a lot of things not going for it and they can be frankly dangerous to wildlife and pets now the really dangerous ones are now banned in the UK unless you have some older stock that actually is really dangerous for hedgehogs and birds then it's not as dangerous as it used to be in the past but the best thing to do is to change your gardening practices don't plant as closely like I have done try to pick them off with non-toxic methods like beer traps and you'll never win the war but you can definitely win some battles through the gardening year now this slug trap that i have it's slug x and i have them in my amazon shop if you're interested in getting some there are lots of slug traps that you can buy but you don't have to even buy motorbikes i'm telling you tt you don't even have to buy these you can use just a shallow dish or a jar just put it in the ground and fill it with beer or that yeasty sugary solution and slugs will be drawn to it fall in and then perish and then you can dispose of them afterwards it won't get them all but it can make a real good dent in their populations so definitely if you have slugs try this i know that 
there are lots of other methods that people have tried, eggshells, wool, things like that. Some of them are quite expensive, like the wool. Eggshells do absolutely nothing. And if you have a tried and tested way for getting rid of slugs and controlling their numbers, leave that down as a comment below because I'm sure that we will all be really interested to hear it. This fills me with so much joy. Look, it's the third and final bed for the polycrub. And while we were in the greenhouse earlier, Josh was out here building the bed. He also siliconed it. He did miss putting in the lower planks there, but they must just be sitting off to the side there. We'll get that sorted. And then the next steps will be filling it and then planting it. The aubergines, the eggplants, are going more towards the middle here the melons at the far end, and then in the house I have a couple of sweet potato plants and I'll be putting them here in the front. Oh my goodness, this is going to be such an incredible and productive space, but the entire garden as well. All of the no-dig beds out there that we put in, the greenhouse, the veggie pod, the containers in general out there, it's really coming on the garden. We've been here just over a year and put in a lot of hard work thus far, but it really is becoming the garden of our dreams. Thank you so much for watching The Garden in May. I will be back next week with a DIY video. It's going to be something that you can do with your excess rhubarb, very exciting. And also I wanna say a special thank you to my Patreon supporters, especially Suzanne and Yeti. Thanks again. I will see you next week for another video here on Lovely Greens. Bye for now.